Welcome back to another episode of Obliterated Companion. I am Peter, one of the hosts of this podcast. And uh, joining me, um, he, you know, for those that follow Cobra Kai, this will be a familiar face and voice. But for those that are, uh, you know, for those that are uh, consuming Obliterated uh, as, as a new viewer and have no attachments to Cobra Kai, uh, director Joel Novoa is uh, joining me today. How are you doing, sir? Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank yeah, you for having always, me. No, absolutely. Always a pleasure to speak with you. You're just uh, uh, one of my favorite people to, to speak with. And I just uh, I love all of your episodes, all, all of your episodes. Um, and, and for those, you, you know, you have an incredible uh, backstory. I'm going to include our first interview uh, discussion together in the show notes for those uh, that want to check that out to learn more about you. Um, Joel, uh, this, this is a brand new project, right, from John, uh, Josh and Hayden. You directed episodes three and six. Um, how much of the, I guess, kind of early production uh, talks are you included in? Well, usually, and depending on the show, um, I'm not so much in the part before we start shooting. But in this case, it was a different process. I actually, the first time I met the guys was for obliterated before I even met them for, for, for Cobra Kai. So we've been talking about this project for many years. I've been like part of like, I haven't been part of the project before, but I have been friends with them while they were like navigating the whole waters before it actually happened. So, you know, it's a, it's a very dear project for myself and, and, you know, also uh, a great opportunity because it's a, it's a season one show. Yeah, I actually forgot that the project was announced a few years back because it was supposed to be on TBS first before before going to Netflix. So yeah, I I now that you mentioned that, I forgot that you you've told me that before that you've met for them uh, with them for Obliterated before Cobra Kai. So yeah, that's that, that's amazing. Um, it's it's been so long the last few years, like time doesn't even really exist anymore, you know? Yeah, you no, know? it, it's. Uh, at some point, like uh, th there was this thing: is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? But like you know, the, the guys are very persistent, and you know, yeah, yeah. they and and Dina, who's uh, one of our executive producers, and Netflix, you know, they made it happen. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in my experience with Cobra Kai, the directors usually direct the episodes that are kind of back to back. Um, can, do you have any insight on how you got three and six? Yeah, um, I think we started talking about it when we were when we were doing Cobra Kai, and in this case, it was a different, uh, you know, it, it's a different game. It's a very different show than Cobra Kai, and it has, it has, like, even if it has a comedy, it, it's kind of it lives in a different world, which was a little bit my expertise when I when I started talking to them, and. And they wanted to keep it short. They wanted to keep it like, even if it's the idea is that it's not limited, but the idea was to do few episodes. So um, there was a little bit like a different scenario. And like it was, uh, this, this is considered an hour an hour show. Um, Cobra Kai is supposed to be a half an hour, even if we do way more than half hours. But in the case of this show, it was a one hour show. So, you know, doing the back to back was, a little bit more difficult and challenging. So I think like because of production reasons, it ended up uh, being that way. And, you know, since I worked with them many times before, they trusted me with the idea of taking the episode after the, the ones they were doing and the episodes before the ones that they were doing. So I'm kind of like continuing their style and trying to set up everything for the grand finale. Yeah. And um, do you have insight or uh, can you talk about like discussions on crafting each episode in real time, one hour for, for the, um, for the characters? Yes. Um, I think in terms of like um, it, 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 the schedule had a lot to do with it. I think initially uh, the initial references were a lot, you know, hangover 24 uh, the guys had a bunch of 90s references that they wanted to kind of include. I will be, obviously, I, I'm a, try to, I, I always try to throw more there. And um, so we kind of started with that. 
And what happened in production was that uh, it was COVID and also um, we were shooting in two different states. And um, so because of that practicality, a lot of episode three was actually shot before episodes one and two, because episode one and two happened mostly in Las Vegas, but most of episode three, we shot it in New Mexico. So um, I, at some point I was actually walking into staff for the first time and it, it, it was a very challenging thing because I had to envision, like I had to imagine how would the guys would be doing this before and uh, and there was always a writer on set so we can always have that that kind of consistency and, and never break away from it but i think um there everything every detail every piece on the show it's uh it's crafted and it's there for a reason even if it's a comedy and even if it has that kind of 90s antagonist world everything is crafted for a reason everything is fun but at the same time has a purpose and and I think a lot of that it was, you know, it was the guys were very clear about everything, but at the same time, we were like building as we were going because of the of the practicalities of the production. So, you know, we were <laughs> assembling as it went. It was it couldn't be any other way for a show that takes place in Vegas. Sure, it, a lot of chaos, right? Because it's so so many people are there. Um, I read about how. Uh, I believe the the party bus chase sequence had the streets had to be closed down um, for like different integrals just so people can yes. pass and then you guys go back and start filming things like that. Yes, it was it was uh, massive and chaotic because for that particular sequence we were on Fremont Street. If you know, like Fre Fremont Street is the craziest part of Las Las Vegas, crazier than everything on the strip. And all the streets that we were using for the chase, uh, you know, coming from the previous episode that happened a little bit closer to the strip, we had to shoot a lot in the strip, but also we had to shoot a lot in, around the areas of Fremont Street. So we needed to like have closures. We had a drone going at some point, uh, which actually kind of crashed at one point. And then when we were doing that, <laughs> like we had one, at some point we had four units in Vegas at the same time. Like we had one unit which was in Fremont, and in Fremont all has this music, like in a lot of chaos and a lot of people. And we were shooting with the actors, like in the middle of everybody. Like we didn't have like a full closure of Fremont. We were just like going in the middle of craziness, and that actually gave the result a very lively feeling and a very alive feeling. And then while 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 I was doing that one, I remember I think Hayden was doing the 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 chase with the drones, and then at the same time we needed to go to the um, how do you call that the the zip line? So we had another camera in the zip line with Paula. So we had like in the zip line camera was looking up while I, while we were shooting down, and it was like a big engineering uh, thing that we had to do in the whole three months, and it worked out incredible from my career in the in the engineering side. It was the most satisfying experience because it turned out great. I don't know how we pulled it off incredible even with all the accidents. But it was crazy. Like all the craziness that you're seeing in front of camera, it was very translated, very similar behind camera. <laughs> yeah, I, I I bet. Um, in episode three, there's a, a I guess you can call it a chase because they're following the I'm forgetting the character's name with the ear, right? And they have to go downstairs, and they're running into Jeff's um fuck fest, right? Is that Jeff's, I think. It's, so it, it's called so, Jake's boss, Jake's fuck fest. Yeah, yeah. I forgot so, about that. When you're reading, uh, I mean, it's it's been a while, but it's just something where you're like, oh wow, this is this is something. When you're reading that on script, how do you guys start to kind of um plan to, to for this sequence? Oh, you have no idea. Um, that was one of the craziest things because um. You know, it, it starts with everything that it's written and the guys, you know, in this case were very R-rated and everything, you know, when you were reading it, like you were at the same time fascinated and like excited to, to, to do something like this. And uh, yeah, as you know, like I, my wife and I, we work together on like getting everything done with the references and all our Google searches were like about Jeff's fuck face, uh, mm -hmm. fest. 
and uh, so we were like researching every single detail. The things that I that I got in that research were things that I've never seen in my life. And I, even today, Google like recommends me some crazy stuff because of it. So, um, you know, once you get the script, you start doing that, right? You get, you start getting crazy ideas just to get elevated as much as you can and try to go crazy. Sometimes I think the guys at some point were like, I think you're going too crazy on this one. And, um, and then, you know, then you start, you need to get it, get the pieces going. So we had, you know, a, a lot of meetings with, a with an intimacy coordinator and we got a lot of the cast that were like, you know, that wanted to embrace that freedom of that scene. And, and so, you know, that scene itself was very, it was very fun to shoot. It was, everybody had the best attitude, like, yeah, it was probably one of the most fun days to shoot. Um, the preparation was crazy. Like, I was very nervous. I was like, wow, I've never done a scene like that in my life. And I was like, how am I going to pull this scene out? Uh, like, it, it, it was like a learning process. And then you also have, in terms of the dramatic part, the, the, the leading up to that. So you're in the elevator and you're with the couple. And then the couple is kind of you know, you never expect that that couple will end up there. So, you know, you have to also take those pieces that, like that, give that story telling beats at the same time that you're telling this bonker story. And then when, when you're shooting that moment, you're kind of like trying to tell the story. And I think one of the things that I remember happening at that point was like, I was very scared of not recognizing that it was the same couple and that it was on the elevator. And so imagine that like, you're shooting with a camera in the middle of this craziness. You probably have like 10 minutes to shoot because, you know, everybody's doing stuff. So like you're with a camera and you're trying to portray everything. And then in the middle of the scene, I was like, oh, how do we know this is the same couple that we saw in the elevator? And so I started like shooting a lot of details around just to see what can I rescue in the editing room. And, you know, I think it translated well. And I think the guys also helped a lot on the, on kind of crafting that in the post-production side. Uh, I think, and I think the story is there, but like in terms of shooting that, it was, it was very fun and very crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it came across um, uh, very clear. I, I recognized them immediately because they had a little bit of dialogue in that elevator sequence too. Um, very, very, very tense, uh, that episode. Um I am really sad for Trunk that it took him a very long time to get food. And <laughs> do you have any insight on, um, like when you guys are filming, uh, like like uh, kind of framing and staging the character? And because like earlier in the season, I think it's episode two where um, Gomez is is making like the the, the grilled cheese sandwiches, yeah. right? And and um, I'm thinking, why doesn't he just grab one? Because there's nothing really raw, you know. Like you still eat that. So, have you guys discussed about the situations where, um, like it's there's there's food he could take a little piece and still eat it, you know? But it it just seems like he 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 like even nachos or or tacos on on the street. Yeah, he. I I think the all the reasoning behind him. I, I was suffering because he was like, I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm like that character in that, I like I'm, <laughs> I, I could understand him completely, um, but I think there was an arch in him, like the level of hunger, like it's supposed to be racing as the episodes go, and um, I think that 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 that's what you know they wanted to portray that, like, you know, it's not the same his hunger level in episode four or in episode five, then the hunger level in episodes one and two. It's like, it kind of goes up and up and up to that. Like, so at the beginning, you know, probably the nachos, you know, like probably what well, with the grilled cheese is, well, there's going to be food somewhere around. It's not like a huge deal yet. And as it goes and as it progresses, it becomes like more and more and more impressively crazy. Uh, that's how I read it when I, when, or, or that was my interpretation in terms of like how to achieve it on the character. Uh, can you talk about uh, Charlie, the DoorDash driver? 
Um, so I I didn't know it's a is it Lori right Lori yeah. Lori Major Lori. yeah so I I didn't I didn't know that was her the writer at first like staff writer uh and it was, shout outs to Kimmy Kimmy's the one that that um, told me that was her I was like oh okay so I, I hadn't figured that out but that's got to be one of the funniest sequences in in the whole season just because like Lori she plays it very well she's and, incredible. Just the dynamic between her and Trunk over the phone, and Trunk is just—he's hangry, right? That's the expression, hangry. Uh, yes. So, uh, can you talk about that? Well, that uh, that was one of the best parts of that episode, you know, <laughs> when she gets shot and drops everything. And um, but I, you know, I—that's one of the scenes that gained a lot by shooting it on the street, on the crate, like. Just for you to know on those scenes, like I couldn't even, I'm, I'm pretty loud and I couldn't get my voice across. So directing that sequence was like, like we we're like signing each other. It was like, you go there and then you, th that's how we communicated that whole time because there was, Raymond was very, very loud and we were like, so that's, and, and, and Lori was, those were her scenes and it was always there. <laughs> And and um, I think like I think since the guys wrote her, uh, they like I think that role was made for her, and so we knew like you know at the beginning of the show you're going to casting processes and there's like a collaborative moment with between the guys, the writers, myself, the producers, but we knew from the get go that that role was written for her so uh, that was one of the pieces in which you you know we were talking earlier about how everything has a purpose in their mind that was one of the things that was in their mind from the get-go uh, now the character of gomez um in, in episode three that's when the ecstasy the molly is starting to kick in do you have any insight on like um because there's a lot of drugs mentioned early on in the season um, do you have insights on like how is there is there somebody that consults on reactions to to drugs and things of that nature so that way they have to look right because uh, I'll be honest I I think Gomez she looks like she is the, the ecstasy is really kicking in like a lot of this <laughs> looks very real to me uh, I may be speaking of little uh, experience I I have been in Las Vegas uh, in the same <laughs> time frame as her. I think a lot of the, the the drug recollection trips were like a mix of all of our experiences. So like it was it was probably more informal, but like one of the things that, that was one of the challenges that I actually had because when I was shooting episode three, since one and two was mostly not shot just a little bit, um, I was like, okay, so what is the level, you know, we have the hungerness level for the yeah, for trunk, but like everybody is going through a different trip. You know, one is going, Paul is going for the guacamole trip, uh, which is uh, accidental. Uh, Tommy is going for. <laughs> uh, Tommy's out. We don't we we don't know what he's in, but he's out. <laughs> and then you have uh, Gomez with the ecstasy. Then you have Nick. Um, it's very close to to Gomez, so they they're kind of like in a they're probably the ones with a similar trip, and then you also have the the probably the the, the alcohol part on um, uh, on Shelly and uh, and well Maya, which we, <laughs> it's kind of self explanatory with her <laughs> Vegas drunkenness trip. So all of them have different arcs. So what like when I was in front of them, I was like, okay, so let's try to distinguish all of their trips as much as we can and be very specific about it. And the guys were very on board with that. And I think they were thinking the same thing. And and like, at some point I, I was like, sometimes I was shooting a scene and I was like, since I don't know what was before, I was like, where are we now in terms of this level? And I started taking some risks. And when I shot it, I was like, I think this is too much, uh, but I'm still gonna do it because Probably, you know, then the guys can probably measure what they want of that. So in the case of Gomez, we started, we created accidentally uh, this language, which was um, 
one of our camera operators had like this very small portable cameras, which allowed him to be like right here with Gomez. So, and then he was like, I, I called it the trip cam. And like, like we were with her all the time and we were with her, like following her that way, just getting like that psychedelic living in Las Vegas type of look. And uh, I mean, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. <laughs> mm. So we were like doing Dutch angles. Like we were going a little bit crazy. And I think we overdid it a little bit just so we can have levels. And luckily and like surprisingly for me, it ended up working and it ended up being like the right level. But when, when we were shooting it, I was like, I didn't know. So like I was kind of embracing whatever happened there. And then everything came together in that kind of trip level. But I think the idea was the more specific we were, the more this context and these trips will be real. And then the, the more this will be real, the more the comedy will come out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, um, it, it, it's a, it's a really brief moment where Gomez, she's like standing in the middle of the casino as well. And I think she's like, she's starting to like trip really hard and she takes a beat where she just kind of like, she's kind of out of it. And then she's like, Oh, right. I'm doing this. Yeah. It's, it's just a very small thing. Like I noticed that because Again, like um, you know, with my experience, I'm like, okay, that's that's very real, you know. Uh, I, I, I I think a lot of that one came from Paula, and mm. she, you know, she she added a lot of beats to 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 that character, and that was one of the privileges of working with all these actors. <laughs> she was very great. Oh, oh that, sure. But... You know, I I just remember when she walks in and sees like all of the uh, the slot machines, and she's like colors or, or like something like that. I'm like, yes, yes, colors. That's it's, it's, like, it's like being at a rave. Um, I believe, I believe episode three introduces the gremlin. The uh, which, which one introduces the, the gremlin? Uh, oh yeah, no, two, two, in, two episode into two? the gremlin. Episode yes, two, okay. at the end of two, but we oh. were shooting it together, so I was. There. Yeah, yeah. Um, can yeah? Can you talk about uh, uh, Jason Manzukis as as the gremlin and um, kind of um, I guess filming that scene since that's you know a CGI character. Yeah, those uh, at at that point, you know, Jason hadn't recorded the voice or anything. So like we were <laughs> the voice at that point was our assistant director, Kevin's mm -hmm. voice. Uh, and like we had like a little like doll or something. And we like I think a a, a lot of it came from the performance and you know the um, I think like, uh, you know, uh, Eugene did a, an amazing job like reacting to like a puppet <laughs> or sometimes to like nothing. And he made that context so real that when they added the CG and, and Jason and everything to it, like it ended up like being kind of like coming alive. And I just rewatched the uh, Gremlins actually. And I was like, oh, like it's, it's uh, it actually, it, it does work very well. And, and, and I think like one of the things that, in my opinion, were we, my first day on the sh on shooting this show was shooting the Gremlin and Eugene. So you know, it was we were block shooting a lot of it, so he had to react to the Gremlin and then no Gremlin and then, but like it was so easy to know from her from the first take the way he was reacting to it. It was very easy to know that it that it was gonna work fine because. We don't have control about the visual part, about how it's going to look, but we do have control on how the actor is reacting to that. So that was very, that was one of the nice surprises of day one to know that, you know, even if the gremlin was like, it was, I was the first one to direct him with the, in front of the gremlin, like he was like already tuned in and, you know, he was like super into that and super into his character and, you know, made it very easy. Well, what did the uh, the puppet look like? Did it look like the actual gremlin? Completely different, huh? No. I think at some point, the puppet was changing. Like, at the beginning, it was like a... I think at some point, we had like a Star Wars one. Then, then we switched into an actual gremlin. Then we switched into kind of like a real gremlin. Then we switched, like... I think there was like... The guy can give you a better notion of this because they kept shooting with the gremlin. But when I was there and I shot a lot of gremlin in... In all of the episodes, I think I showed with like four different types of gremlin, including nothing, including one which was just the air. <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, and I believe episode three is also the one where um where Maya gets gets a uh, wait where where Maya tries to stop the guy and then then yes. they uh, take that off right. Um, I yeah, thought, that's when she gets kidnapped. So um, I don't know if this was direction or if this is Kimmy or if this was on script, but when she gets out and she the way she stands and puts her hand out, yeah. It's the funniest Kimi. thing ever. Yeah, that was all Kimmy. That's Kimmy. Kimmy. Wow. Uh, Kimmy added. Yeah, all of them added a lot to their characters. Like, and I think one of the privileges of being a director is that what my style is, I try to adapt to the actors and try to see each one has a different personality and just kind of like have to read how everybody is, and then. You know, everybody has a strong, like a strength. And then you try to maximize on that strength, but it comes from them, never comes from me. And I think Kimi's strength was first, she's the, I've never seen somebody learn so many <laughs> dialogues so quick. Like her dialogues were like that. And sometimes she received it like, like short notice. And she, I think we never, like she was doing one takes all the time. And she added a lot of like, improvisational comedy and like situational comedy to that character and and it made that context very real and so like she she added that she added that like she she added a lot of that throughout the episode and throughout the other episodes as well um can you think of any easter eggs in episode three before we move on to six that that um you know i i probably missed a lot you know because still pretty early here Hmm. I'm sure there were because we all we were always talking about it. it was so long ago because we shot this more than a right. year ago. So yeah, I, I I think we can we can move into episode six because there's there's something I do want to ask and I believe it's in that episode. Okay, right. Joe. I think that was uh, Joe and Luan. Yes, they they would yep. probably be <laughs> better yeah. for that. One one of my favorite episodes, and I'm glad that the three of you guys got to uh, reunite. Um. Now let's start with this. You know, we talked about Easter eggs. We got some cameos in episode six as well. Now, the very first time um, I binged it, there was someone that looked like somebody, and I just like dismissed it. And then going back, I was like, this extra looks a lot like Courtney Hangler from Cobra Kai. And I find <laughs> out, and I find out that it is. Can you um talk about her? Uh she she was um she was down there to kind of observe you as director. Like, well, what was uh, the reasoning for, for her to be down there ultimately ending up in the episode as well? Yes, no, she, she's great. She, she was, uh, she was observing me and like, like as in, the, in the directing side and she's super talented. And, you know, at some point she was there and we were like, you know, you, you, you have to be here, you know, you're, you, you know, that, that's actually a big Easter egg that, happened on site it was like not like previously planned but like she was so cool about it that you know we, we had to do it um and then what, what about having joe be her date like um <laughs> that was like they, they actually have joe has performance on on that one and um i think i pitched the idea like i think he, he wanted to be in a scene or something on the episode and I, I I was the one that I think I pitched the idea of like, you know, he could be like a, you know, kind of like a, somebody who's in Vegas and you know, they haven't slept all night and they ended up like going there to marry and, you know, I kind of gave him like a full context uh, because, you know, I wanted at the end, we've done that in other episodes and stuff and you always want, like I did it with Bob on Cobra Kai as well and and, you know, you always want that to stay on the cuts. And sometimes, you know, it gets thrown away if it doesn't have power. So we kind of gave, we, they have like a whole backstory there of why they were there. And, you know, it worked and it actually added to the scene. And, you know, it's an Easter egg, but for the people that don't know them, or like, or the people that don't, that don't follow Cobra Kai, it's like, it does work on the style of the show. Uh, episode six also has the scene where the, the, the women, they go to the club. Right and uh, DJ Candy Corn and, and all that stuff. Can you can you talk about uh, that scene? Yes, uh, that was actually 
that was one of my favorite. Fremont and all that sequence were my two favorite in terms of like the engineering and everything. Like we wanted to kind of convey this feeling. Like since they've been clubbing so much on the episode on on the show, and you know there was a lot of this Vegas vibe. Uh, the guys had this like after party vibe, and I pitched them the idea of like going a little bit more like Berlin kind of like underworld and. You know, we kind of build that idea there in that club, which is kind of like a you know underworld type of like like thing. And then you have Candy Corn, which actually we shot that episode before we shot before they shot episodes one and two. So you know, I know there's like Easter eggs with Candy Corn before, but like the idea at that point at that point, like when I was shooting that, I thought that Candy Corn was never on camera, or there was not even a mention of Candy Corn before that. And so we kind of build it that way. So, you know, you had this kind of superstar DJ and then he has that scene with, uh, with Alison, which is incredible. Like when he, when he takes his mask out, it's, it's, and the impro at some point I would love the guys to release the bloopers of that scene or not even the bloopers, but the improvisations of that scene. You have no idea, like probably we did, let's say six takes of that every take. It's a completely like, like sometimes he went into like this world like like it it it's it's very funny to see all the outtakes of that scene. I think if they do uh, one of those extended edition Blu-rays or something, they have to put that because it's amazing. I hope so because uh, with Cobra Kai, they you know released the DVDs with like some bloopers too. So you know maybe maybe we'll get them. Um, in it, on, on the other side of town, we have the guys who show up to a diner, and this is also one of my uh, favorite sequences. Oh, also the the donut sequence. I don't know if that's three or six uh, with Trunk, where he finds like, a donut box. Um, a box oh of, yeah, that's yeah. six. Six. Okay, that's got to be one of the funniest sequences <laughs> because he is so angry. He he's he's talking to the box, you know, and opens <laughs> it up and it's completely. Can you talk about that scene and then and then we'll move on to the diner. Actually, that scene with the donut, you know, there, there are some scenes that you see on the page that are very, you, you look at them and you're like, oh, this is a very easy scene to do. But that scene with the donuts actually took us a lot of time because there was a, a lot of engineering about the comedy of that scene. It was, okay, so he sees the box, but then if he sees that, like, as he was reading, the box was inside the car and then he grabbed the box. But then, like, when I was executing it, he grabbed the box and he was like, we were like, well, but if he's grabbing the box, then the box, he would already feel the weight of it. So it couldn't be like such a long grab. So we had to like change it. But like a lot of the engineering pieces on that scene is what makes the comedy work. It's like he's opening the door. He's already like reacting to it before, before even like grabbing the box. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of like mechanical pieces about it. And also they were improvising a lot. Like they were... I think that one of the biggest problems here was like keeping things serious because like we were having a lot of fun with those scenes. So like, you know, and then the guys were improvising all the time. So, you know, we were like, it, it was, it was fun. And it, it, for me, it was like, a, I've never done a project like this in my life. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, those type of scenes always like are incredible to like execute. And in terms of what you're saying with the, regards to the, to, you know, to the whole guy's uh, adventure, you know, when they have that split. Uh, you were going to talk about the Elvi, all the Elvi arc, right? Uh, no, which one? The When they go with the Elvis, you know, to the, yes. to the diner. Yeah, I think... That, that, that diner kind of reminded me of, like, um, Pulp Fiction. You know, like, everybody's at the diner. You, you have Haggerty in the bathroom <laughs> with all, all the drugs... You know, they don't know that. But then you have Trunk and McKnight uh, trying to order food. And I love the way Trunk orders his food. He says, yeah, you know, get the bowl of grease. If you, you know, if you have that, do that or or whatever. I just I love that whole sequence. And um, and then you have uh, Paul show up as well on the phone call. This, so much is going on at this moment. Can you talk about yeah. like kind of crafting how everybody's there, but you guys have to be careful that they don't actually run into each other well i i think one of the good things about it and I, i'll give that credit to to joe and luan is 
Yeah, I think last time we spoke about like every writer on Cobra Kai has like a different ability. Uh, some are like more like character oriented. Some are more like the craziness. You know, you have you know and, uh, and Michael, you have Bob, you have like everybody has like a different world. Joe and Luan, I think, are very, very, very visual. And they're so visual that they convey on the script that feeling already. So when you come there, like I arrived the first day, you know, for production to the diner and you read like how it's written and you, as a director, the first thing you do is you start looking for, in, for inconsistencies. You're like, okay, so if this scene is happening here and that scene is happening there, why aren't they looking at each other? And I couldn't find one inconsistency on this episode. Like I couldn't find... I couldn't get them in anything. And so that made my job so easy because all I had to do was to like execute this rhythm and kind of giving this kind of musical vibe to everything and like mixing. Like, I think the collaboration that we have in a lot of the episodes uh, on Cobra Kai as well with, with them is, it's very visual, it's very, uh, it's very easy to elevate the content together and and to create these type of situations which you know i'm guessing when they received the the you know the the idea for the script it was like how are we going to do this but when they actually executed it like and i and i it gets to me it's like wow this is actually very easy to execute and and very simple simple storytelling and, and very rhythmic storytelling so you know that that episode for me has it all like it's a uh, in, in 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 that visual elements convention in in the script did they have the uh the elvis song already in there or is that something like the the music supervisor put it put in it changed a little bit like i was surprised because you know i, I the guys showed me a little bit the final cut of those episodes and a lot of the proposals that i made on the on the on this on the music part it actually stayed until the end so I was pleasantly surprised about that. And that's not usual in many of the shows that I go to. <laughs> and in terms of the song, I, I, I think they wanted a different one at the beginning. Where I, but like, I think this was the, the second one that like the second choice. So we kind of, we knew a little bit the vibe and we knew where we were going and we were actually doing playback on set to just get the rhythm right. But like, it did change a little bit for, you know, logistical reasons but it ended up being very close to what we wanted um after the fight with all the elvises and um earlier we had seen uh the the waitress uh beatrice she was she was fighting paul and she's got him in a headlock and then a little bit later after you kind of see the aftermath of the fight she's kind of cowered down on the floor like holding her arm so like whatever happened to her she 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 knows not to fuck with these guys Right. Like, do you have any um, insight on to what happened to Beatrice, but also maybe the discussion with the, the actors of, you know, hey, do something, um, you know, that that will reflect the, the, the fight, you know, like the, how did you guys position some of the uh, the people? I think we actually showed that like, it was so long ago that I don't remember exactly, but we did have a bit of Beatrice. I don't, I, was it Paul himself who did it? Another question for Joanne Luan, but I remember we did have a bit of like her being like falling to the ground and being beat up. But like in terms of that that whole choreography, like <laughs> I just love when uh, when Nick climbs on top of the Elva, <laughs> like climbs. But like I, we wanted to make it messy and crazy and like you know very like unorganized and like more like a rusty fight than like a very fun choreography. And uh, so, and it was like a very limited space there. So we, that took a lot of prep because we didn't have too much time to shoot it actually. That All that fight we shot it in one day. And, um, and we had to have somebody hitting the, you know, the, yeah, for the music to play. And, you know, all of that had to happen in that same moment. And then, so we ha it had a lot of engineering pieces. I do work a lot with boards. So I was like boarding, like, okay, so this part, this part of the fight, this part, look, kind of like to tell the story of the fight. 
And we kind of executed that story of the fight like area by area. And that's how we were able to maximize efficiency. Um, but it was a very challenging one. Like that, that fight was challenging to, to do. Uh, everything on this show was very challenging in a good way. <laughs> yeah, and, and and episode six seems very technical. Just all, all the moving pieces, like like you discussed. Um, uh, let me see. I think I was going to ask about. Am I ready to move on from from that? Oh, oh no, the bathroom. So we we have to talk about Haggerty and and Yanni. Not too much because like you know it, it's a pretty simple scene, but you know it goes from a discussion how she has all these drugs. And she suggests, you know, he can snort it off her off her ass, I, I believe was her language. And um, later on, we see them on the ground and there's drugs all over the place. But what I noticed was along the walls, there seems to be like just just individual lines of folk or whatever. It, it, I, I thought that was really interesting. It's like, wait, so they cut out set of lines and just, was that just more to um for like for humor uh kind of the setting up that uh, the bathroom yeah i think the idea for the bathroom was making a scene that was you know funny and probably even even could that could potentially be like very r-rated scene but like making it be beautiful so like my approach was you know these are two people who probably their relationship is going to last i don't know three more hours Ten and, minutes, according to Maddox. Th well, ten minutes actually. Yeah. So, like, you know, but like, it has to be beautiful. Like, it for the sake of the episode and for the sake of that moment and their present. That's probably one of the most beautiful things that happened to both of them. So you have this kind of grotesque world of like drugs and like bathrooms and like everything is like everything is what nothing there is romantic in terms of the environment. But the way it's shot, it's very romantic. It's like, you know, it's very, it's a dance. It's a, it's a, it's a love story. And so that's my idea there. And I put a lot of effort into that is, and, you know, we, we did a lot of reference and a lot of like, but it's like how to convey a love story in this very not like, not love story setting. And I think that's what that scene became. I'm very proud of those scenes because I, I don't know, it's what you said. It's like, it's a very technical episode in a way. And it's very, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm as a director, I'm very proud of how everything kind of ended up putting together. <laughs> episode six uh, opened up with the, uh, the, 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 the bridge, right. Or the, uh, the, the father and son fishing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What, what what was his name? Timmy, Timmy. Oh, um, Timmy. You, you know maybe I I forget. Yeah, I think I just, Timmy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just remember you know ha, uh, um well the, the father says like will you get off and Hagrid's like I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> that scene, that scene like shooting that scene was crazy because. Like they were on this boat, and then you had Timmy there with somebody. But at the same time, you know, that it's it's a kid, so you don't want to shoot all those scenes together. You want to like shoot them dev separately, and then just put them on like VFX together. So, like the idea there was to convey like, oh, it's a beautiful day in like this river in Las Vegas, <laughs> and then, like this guy is just woke up and he's like, uh, you know, having sex on top of a boat in front of poor little Timmy, who was just like lost his childhood so for me that i treated that scene like a coming of age so it's like uh you know tv was never the same after that moment <laughs> i i don't know if it's a sound editor or the the foley artist but the the, the sound of the the slapping skin sounded very realistic <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure the guys had a lot to do with that they're very specific with the sound i bet um and we'll, well, you know, we'll kind of end up with this uh, or end the conversation with this sequence. But uh, we fast forward to the pawn shop, right? Um, continuing on the the journey of love with Haggerty and Yanni. Uh, I think Joe and Luan's episode uh, six kind of reminded me a little bit of their uh, season five, episode two, Mole, where you have Chosen and Terry Silver. Here you have Haggerty with Maddox, but... But uh, Haggerty has no idea who these guys are. 
And so like the tension is kind of there and you're just like, oh, is somebody going to slip? Can you talk about filming that scene? Well, you had to, well, more than, you know, everybody in that scene was like incredible in the performance side. And you have this standoff with, between two acting giants, like, <laughs> you like, it, as in the directing side, you know, it was about conveying that tension, right? Kind of like, it's funny. It's actually a very funny scene, but you know, it's a, uh, you don't, with them, you don't have to do too much there. It's like, you know, it's there. It's already there. It's, it's all about simple things like where is the placement of the device and like where those are the elements that you can provide to them as a director. It's like, you know, adding, creating a context of like placing items around them in a way that they can properly react to each other. Um, but after that, it's all them. And I think you kind of drive them to where you want them to be by doing that. But like, it's, a, you know, it's a, an, an, an encounter of giants. <laughs> and that's how I portray that scene. I, I kind of forgot about the, a couple of moments earlier in episode six. And just, just in case I don't get a chance to talk to Joe and Lawan, we have insight on, um, uh, like, like during the writing, just in, insight on like characters that they encounter early on, like um, DJ Candycorn, for example. Like, uh, I, I do wonder how do they decide which characters will show up again in later episodes? Because you have the um, the women at the bottom of the stairs as uh, Ava, Gomez, and Maya is going up. Right, then they have the encounter right there, and then upstairs. Um, and then, but also in episode three, where Gomez runs into Sarah, the bride, right? Is that her name? Sarah? Yeah. Yeah. So just kind of like how they, they kind of bring back some of the characters we saw like in the first two episodes. That's all on the writing side. And I think they kind of have this character. I think the idea that they wanted to portray was the reality of Las Vegas, which is that, you know, in a night in Las Vegas, you see somebody and then you see them again. And then you see, it's like, it's like, you know, in a night in Las Vegas, anything can happen. And part of that is like, you have recurring characters. And, and it's like, you know, it's so Las Vegas becomes like a, like a movie studio in which, you know, people are like placed in different places and you see them again and you see them again. And it's like, you're, you're encountering and you're like going through a whole storytelling through one night in the middle of this very contained place, which has like, I don't know, five party places that everybody goes to. And everybody ends up like accidentally jumping into each other there. And I think that's very much kind of in this tricky feeling of the show. And, and that's why I think they, they kind of do that. And, and I think that's one of the strong parts of the show. Yeah, it, it's so well crafted. It's just very intricate. You know, that's what I continue to say, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, the writing styles. Uh, Joel, is, is there any uh, Easter eggs you could think of from uh, season six that's worth, or season six, episode six, worth uh, mentioning? Anything you know, we we talk about the the cameos with um, you know, uh, writer Joe and and uh, Courtney Hangler from Cobra Kai. Mm, no, <laughs> I don't remember. Like those are the things that I. I don't think I had too many on six. I think uh, most of them were at the beginning or at the end of the show. Yeah. Oh, I, I guess, you know, we, we talked about this off mic, but uh, at the Black Ops site, we talked about how, um, like, in, in the background, you can see, like, windows on the doors and, and, and whatnot, and you see this, the, 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 the flare just coming in from the light. Um, just, I, I, I love the look of that. It doesn't sound, uh, is that something you wanted, or was that just, like, uh, I don't know if that's the cinematographer? Yes, uh, the cinematographer is Abe Martinez, and he's, uh, you know, he's incredible. And he kind of likes that kind of realistic feeling. So we kind of spotted, like, that was coming through the, through the side. And we thought, like, well, that, that's actually a very cool flair to have there. So we just took the risk and just kept it there. Uh, because, you know, we could have taken it out, but, like, he just decided to leave it there. And I thought it was a right call because, you know, it was pretty cool to kind of have that that feeling. And I think he, he, he likes a lot that. He likes a lot kind of like filling the place with like lights that are coming, all justifiable lights. 
and you know that's one of his strong points. <laughs> oh yeah, it's just, um really really amazing work uh, on on the it, you know and this is just the first season you know so I you know do, do, don't I have no idea what what could even happen in a season two you know just because it's not to not to say that everything's wrapped up but I'm just like where where, where do you guys go you know from from here you know, based off the <laughs> don't concept. worry me neither. <laughs> so um, I, I, I I can think of a lot of ideas, but I, I right now I don't have any. Yeah, I they, they don't pay me enough to come up with them. That's why you know the writers do what they do. <laughs> um, it, uh, so we're recording this before the show releases. I don't know if you have a bunch of pictures you're holding on to to share after its release. Um, if if you do, you know, you want to plug uh, any social media so people can follow you. Yes, uh, my Instagram, that's where I always publish everything, is Joel Nova. Uh, last name is N-O-V-O-A. And uh, yeah, I'm going to try to, uh, everything I have, I'm going to put it there. I have videos, photos, stuff, but obviously nothing I can do right now until we actually release. <laughs> yep. So um, well, you'll be hearing this after the show's release. So hopefully there's some stuff uh, now. So they, So they should be able to go check that out. Um, for me, yeah. if you guys want to follow me on Instagram, I am at Obliterated Companion, the, the companion spelled with a K on Twitter or I guess X, depending who you want to ask. Uh, you can find me there on Obliterated Pod, P-O-D. So um, thank you guys for tuning in this uh, to this episode and I'll see you next time.